Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. We are here with the team in beautiful Pittsfield, Vermont. I've got Sephra on my right. I've got Dave standing in for Colonel Nye. He is our resident philosopher, millennial. And we got Dr. Johnny. And we have Brian Kuliana. Yeah. If and I pronounce that correctly, I'm Marion, the communist. Um, <laughs> Brian is awesome. I met Brian in, in Hawaii. His, uh, his dad, I don't want to give away too much, but his dad was the original like big wave surfer dude. Um, Brian Brian's created uh, Buffalo. Uh, Brian's created all um, really cool. Well, I'm not going to give it away. You're going to love this podcast. Let's check it out. And if you don't come out the other side of this thing better, well, I'll eat my microphone. Aloha. <laughs> We are here in Hawaii with the famous Brian K. Aulana. Perfect. Tell me about your upbringing. Let's go way back. I want to know where you came from, how you ended up to be who you are today. So you, you grew up here in Hawaii? So grew up here in Hawaii on the west side of Oahu, um, Makaha being specific. And um, grew up, you know, my father is a legendary um, surfer who were one of the pioneer surfers in the days. Um, the only surfing contest in the whole world will ac actually existed at Macaw Beach. At the beach you hang out. Yeah, yeah, that's and where surfing grew up at. Pretty much, yeah. So, but your dad, what was his name? Buffalo. Buffalo, and so and yeah. so, if we if we were any surfers out there checking out would know the name Buffalo. Yeah, I mean anyone who actually surf, if they don't know my dad or our family, they just started surfing. Got it. Yeah. yeah. All right. So he, so your dad. Um, when was it invented? When was surf? When did surfing start? Surfing? Well, surfing has yeah, started, you know, in the back of the God, you know, in the ancient days, you know, where only the the chiefs and royalty, you know, queens and princesses were the only ones that actually surf back in the days. And then uh, the story I heard was when they would get older, they still had the passion for surfing, so they would uh, pass it on to um, one of their warriors, you know, to surf through them, you know, and kind of watch them and enjoy the ocean and enjoy them kind of dancing across the waves and stuff too. So there's all different types of surfing that people think is one type that they would surf these big huge boards, but it, there was a, a bunch of different type of equipment they would use, you know, pipo board and alliya and olu board. It's all different types of But these were boards. these were just pieces of wood that they chopped it, from a tree. It was basically a, a tree that was just chopped and formed into a surfboard and what the modern board is today um, you know, Hawaiians are surfing, you know, those made out of wood with no skegs, you know, and, and surfing the same type of waves you're surfing on, you know, whether it's big or small or and fast just, or slow. And they just kept modifying it to get the perfect board, I guess. Um, yeah, like anything, you know, the, the whole thing about the future you can guarantee is always change, right? So, yeah. you know, anything they would try and change for the betterment of, you know, the sport, they would always progress, you know, further and further. I mean, even like right now, surfing has changed so much, you know, right now. I mean, just last week, uh, one of the surfers is diving into hydrofoils, which we play on hydrofoils. It's, you know, you're flying now above the water and traveling so, really so fast. So it's a jet ski that comes out of the water? No, it's a, a, like an airplane uh, fin that's designed under the water, a long fin, and it comes up and rises above the water. So you're surfing like three feet above the water. Wow. Yeah. What's the benefit to that? Um, being cool. Well, you can, you know, catch waves further out. You can surf from island to island, you know. So that that's the, you know, surfing has now progressed not just coastal, but now inland. You know, now, you know, uh, you know, without com company Honokea, um, surfing has been developed, you know, inland where they had machines now that can create an Olympic um, style wave, you know, to where I think a uh, uh, surfing, um, champion would come from Minnesota or Idaho or wow. someplace inland, you know. Wow. And so I, I think it's going to be, you know, even more than what it is now. So, so but let's go back. So you're on this beach and um, you're growing up and what's it like? You're just sitting around doing uh, bonfires every day, surfing? You know, my lifestyle have and, and my upbringing was such a rich childhood for me. It wasn't about money. It was more about um, the values of, of family, friends. Um, we were never hungry. We never starved. Um, our icebox was the ocean. My father would dive and he w wouldn't only feed us, he would feed the whole beach. So everyone who walked on our sand, everyone who swam in the water, he would feed them, regardless where you're from, regardless what color of skin you are. He would bring you in and invite you and, and feast you and 
you know, and that was the way of life that we were brought up, was always sharing, you know. And the knowledge that my father especially passed on about um, understanding the ocean, you know, in all the greatest dangers that exist out there became our playground, you know. So for us guys, you know, the giant rip currents was our merry-go-round, you know. The backwash was our trampoline, you know. The big surf was our roller coaster. So for us, it was, you know, just a fun place, you know, to, to exist, to be in. And just, you know, the, the ocean is like our school. It would just give you so much different things that you would learn along the way. But it was also our church because it would demand respect, you know, to where, you know, you're out in the water. And sometimes, you know, things that you make, the decisions, there's consequences, you know, along the way. And you're talking to the man upstairs, you know, all of the time. So it humbles yourself to always say that I'm not the greatest, but at least I can be great at this time. And the things that you learn ac across, you know, life is things that, you know, is such a great treasure to share with, you know, your friends and your family and everyone else. So that's an amazing um, upbringing. You, how big was the family? Um, I have two brothers, two sisters, you know, so there was five of us. Uh, you in our family. You lived in the sea. You were like the family of the sea. Actually, my house was right where we launched, right there. There was a two-story um, building right on that beach, right there. That so was awesome. that was our house, right there. So my window was looking straight out at the beach, you know, being brought up. And uh, my father threw us in the water when we were babies. You know, we weren't even walking, but we all could swim, you know. And basically, he would throw us into the current, and he would teach us guys how to utilize the ocean and you know, like just surf the current and, and come in and go back out and jump back in the current and go back. And like I said, it was a, a, a play thing and how to um, exist in, in huge waves and impacts. And the wave would only hold you under for so long, as long as you relax. And then, you know, knowing when to swim, knowing how to float, all these kind of things. So things that we took advantage when we were young is only now that, you know, I've, I've been teaching other people around the world, you know, how to exist around the oceans, you know. So let's talk about that. So you have a company. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, you have many companies. Yeah, yeah. You do many things. But, mm -hmm. but the company uh, and the focus that teaches people water safety, what is that? Well, I have um, several different, you know, companies that I still teach and train all the government uh, employees. Um, basically, I teach ocean risk management how to mitigate risks, how to um, prevent risk. and um, so, so basically military that or, or whoever that's mm -hmm. working in the sea, you teach them yeah. um, how to avoid risks. Yeah, a lot of the military and stuff too. You know, people look at life in black and white where there is black and white decisions that you have to make yes and no, but there's a lot of colors in between. People look at the gray things, I look at the colors because in the ocean, you know, things change all the times and you have to adapt and you have to um, sometimes think out of the box because even though you did things one way it may never happen the same way again right. so you always have to keep an open mind you know and learn that you have different tools that you can pull up at any time so again in ocean survival is you only as good as the people you hang around with because again I'm not Superman and I can get hurt you know but when I do get hurt do I have the process in place because I never blame people about what happens, but I do blame the process, you know? So if you don't have the, the process with the knowledge and the skill, it's not worth it, you know? So again, you know, being in the ocean, it's all about, you know, people say fear, right? You know, how come you're fearless and why don't you, you're not afraid? And it's not about your emotions out in the ocean. It's more about knowledge. The more knowledge you have about what you're dealing with, the less fear you have. If I can control every outcome, what fear do you have, you know? So that's the thing you gotta ask yourself. Can you control the outcome? And once you ask that and say, I have a better calculated chance to control my outcome, to exist out there, you know? So for me, it's more play. But, but in many, I mean, you're talking about the ocean. If we, if we expand that thought to people having fear in general, mm -hmm. um, people don't have knowledge. That's why they are yeah. fearful. So, yeah. so what you're saying is gain as much knowledge as you can and fear should dissipate yeah I mean you know like this public speaking right you know basic a lot of people they don't, don't want to go out in the public and speak for fear of being you know ridiculed or being uh, um, I, you know embarrassed or embarrassed or, or, or picked apart and stuff so they're thinking about what other people would say you know a lot of the times so if you try to think back like hey for me if I go public speaking because I used to be afraid if I come out and talk in the public 
I just can sit down and make like I'm talking to me and you or one of my friends or one of my families and just be honest to myself and honest to you and honest to everybody else because what fear do I have? Sure. None. I'm just speaking honestly, you know? If, if I make A, I'm going to laugh because I'm not going to, you're not going to laugh at me. I'm going to laugh with you, you know? I just did something funny and made somebody else laugh. Great, you know? So for that, you know, again, it's all about your context in your mind is, you know, for me, I have no fear because I really don't care what other people think. Because my goal and my mission is being achieved. My success has always been successful. I had a lot of mistakes and a lot of failures, but I have a lot more success of what that's, I do. That's yeah. the game, right? Like, yeah. it's okay to fail. Yeah, it is okay to fail, you know? Yeah. And the, the whole thing, again, is, you know, like how you train, right? It's not how much, you know, or, or how you train the intensity, but how much consistency in every day and program yourself because in again in anything that we do it, it's always like some days is bad but some days is good and some days is bad some days is good but then if i keep going i'll only get better and better and keep flying higher and higher and higher you know so again it's um setting that process up being you know uh, vigilant and and kind of like having the support around you and stuff too because sometimes you feel like, ah, today, not the day, but you know, just having that extra oomph and that friend and you know, kind of that nudge helps sure. a long way and vice versa, nudging your friend also too. So group, you know, going forward is, is such a powerful thing. And I always feel, you know, for me, it's, it's a family value, it's a family atmosphere and always driving and striving to not perfection, but having the, the enough, you know, and, and to, to be, you know, for me, my goal is to make you better than me, you know? Like today in the water and stuff too. It's not me. You, you were better than me. No. <laughs> just just but to be clear. It, it's, it's not me showing you how good I am. Right. It's more of me trying to figure out how can I give you as much knowledge and skill that I know I have, but to build you better than what you came with to take away something else. You know, because to me, that's the nugget of knowledge that it's like, oh, I gained that small seed that hopefully later on it grows into something bigger that you might twist that around into something like, hey, Brian, remember the first time I came? Right. This is what I'm doing now. And boom, and now you gave me this whole plant with this whole fruit and this different knowledge. And it's like, wow, yeah. that small seed just planted something even greater. So in other words, next time I see you, if we're doing underwater burpees with rocks, yeah. then, you, then I've expanded your thoughts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll call it underwater throwing up for me. <laughs> so, so um, tell me about some of the other. Tell me all the businesses you're involved in. You you train uh, famous actors and actresses in the water. So I work full time in the film industry, right? You know, um, my main job is being a stuntman, stunt coordinator, and I also direct. So a lot of the action second unit directing um, do that. Um, really educating production, you know, more so of some of the the producers of you know again the process. You know, always think backwards in how do you succeed in making this a successful movie, you know? And how do you time frame this to better suit? Because some of the things they don't understand is some of the the biggest diva out in a, you know, in that movie is sometimes the ocean. The ocean and the waves won't show up on time. Sure. It, it won't be cooperating when you want to come. The sun won't be there sometimes. So you have to be ready for that environment and have the team ready. So you really want a production that knows all the answers and not asking a lot of questions. You don't want someone in a society, so what do I do now? What do I do now? You want someone to know what to do and when to do it. You know? So having those people surrounded you know, around you just makes things a lot more you know, fluid. You know? Sure, yeah. sure. And then you've got, you've got, you manufacture some equipment that goes out in the water? So, yeah, so uh, you have a company, C4 Waterman, so manufacture a lot of, you know, it's a stand-up company, but it's also in anything that we do in the water. So I'm known not just as a surfer, but more, known more as a waterman. So to kind of break that down, it's like, you know, when I go to North Shore, there's like short borders, long borders, body borders, body surface, and people tend to put labels on themselves where, you know, on my side of the island, we focus not on labels, but the content. It's like looking at one can. You can put, you know, labels on any can, but what's really more um, valuable is what, what's in the content of that can, sure. you know? So that's the thing is, you can have a, a thousand certifications, but when you're out in the ocean, that plastic card, 
doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything, sure. you know. So it's. So, it, so and you've and you've uh, you've been the creative force behind some unique uh, ways to rescue surfers and so forth in the water. Yeah. So a lot of the rescue techniques from being just basic um, techniques of, of using just your mind and your body to anything from what's you know your surroundings that you can utilize to getting to the more technical you know, use of personal watercrafts, you know, with jet skis and stuff. Um, how to, you know, again, you know, the way I train myself is I break myself into five parts. Is like I train to have the strength to hold back danger, the speed to outrun danger, the agility to outmaneuver danger, uh, flexibility to bend and contort to danger, so you reduce injury, and last but not least, endurance to outlast danger. And that's an acronym for SAFE. S S A F E. Love so that's strength, speed, agility, flexibility, endurance. So that's the five different parts. Because you can have people they're doing weights and they're doing runs and all this kind of stuff and they're isolating different components. But when you package everything together and you're out in the environment, you you have to be like, oh, am I strong enough to push this ski into the water? You know, so I can get out there. You know, am I fast enough to get and outrun these waves? Am I maneuverable enough to outmaneuver danger when danger is there? You know, am I flexible enough because I would reduce my injury? And again, we spend eight to ten hours in the ocean. Do I have the endurance to outlast? You know, that whole day of rescuing. Yeah. So that's the, the the mind frame. A lot of times that you know, when we're training guys to think about those five components. What would you say to uh, those people out there that are? looking for motivation, looking to get excited, looking to do something new, maybe surf, speak on, on a stage, what would you say? Have fun, you know, I mean, life is short, you know, and, um, you know, whatever you think, I, I think a lot of things that I've learned is don't worry about the criticism, you know, because if people criticize you, do it again, you know, if people shove your face into the ground, pick yourself back up, do it again, you know, because you have the choice to always do it again. But when you stop doing it, you've given up. That's the easy thing to do. Right. The hardest thing is to get back up and do it again. Keep going at it. Keep going, yeah. And by the way, at the end of the day, the most respected people are the ones that keep going at it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, like one of my friends, he was better at me in uh, uh, when we first started uh, surf skiing, kayaking. So we both bought these surf skis, and we made a bet that you know we would race each other for three miles. And knew nothing about kayaking, right? So he raced, and he was a little better than me. But we made this bet, and the bet was to bring a cup of coffee and crawl on your hands and knees between all these lifeguards like on Gauntlet and bring them you know, right to his chin, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. So that was the bet. You know? So I, of course I lost the bet, right? You know, so I humbled myself and gave him the coffee, and everybody laughed, and I laughed too. But I said, okay, one week from now, we're going to train, and we'll do them again. So I, I did them three times, lost. So by the fourth week, because I kept training, now I became better. Went and worked with this Olympic um, athlete <laughs> nice. paddle, and you know, always try to gain and, and learn, right? So I, I became, you know, more balanced, more, you know, in, involved and stuff too, and, and I won. So now I'm sitting at the end of the thing. So now it's my friend who I know that he can't take it. <laughs> I can. So the battle was lost before the thing even begun, you sure. know. So, you know, and that's the, the whole fun about it and stuff too is, you know, it's, there's always challenges along the way, and even with close friends and stuff too, but it, it's that camaraderie of, of laughing together, not laughing at each other. Sure. Mm -hmm. You're awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. Right on, Joe. What's your next big uh, project? Oh, my God. Hawaii Five O coming up uh, nice. in a month, and what else? I got another feature movie. Um, my, my main thing right now is really trying to be more involved with the at-risk kids, you know, so we get the junior lifeguards that coming out here. So we like to take the real rotten kids and the ones that, you know, usually trying to rip off someone else and trying to do bad is take those kids and teach them more or values, you know. And give them a rock like you gave me. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> let, let them go to my church and go see God a little while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, very great representation of just Hawaiian culture in general. You know, we think about Hawaii, we think about surfing, but he talked a lot about um, having been raised with Hawaiian values and sharing and contributing. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I thought it was just really, really cool. Everything he had to say about, um, about his life and how he's now using it to better other people. Mm -hmm. One thing that I took away from this is that uh, the Hawaiian culture, seeing the ocean as your school, 
seeing the ocean as your church. Yeah. It was just an amazing image for me, just using your environment to create a very unique set of values, very unique say, way of seeing the world, interpreting problems and solving problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I think I've talked about the Hawaiian culture before in a previous podcast. From a land use perspective, traditionally they used to farm from the top of their watershed all the way down to the ocean. That would be like a family or a tribal's whole niche. And um, they just have such connection with their land and have such respect for it. And they have um, one of the strongest intact models of culture. I've, I've mentioned John Young before in his Eight Shields model of mentoring where he teaches people how to recreate positive forms of community. And there's a lot of modeling that happens off of what, how the Hawaiian cultures are resilient. We've talked about when they had that, um, I don't know if it was a tsunami. I forget what it was exactly. Hurricane. It was a hurricane. There you go. Thanks, Johnny. Um, yeah, there was a hurricane. And again, there, there, all this aid and relief tries to come in to help them. And the elders were saying like, hey, international world, like, hold off for a second. We have a really strong culture, and we need a second to come together as our own community. Mm. So um, Hawaii is beautiful. And, yeah, using the oceans as a school, I mean, ain't nothing better. I've, I've, uh, I've done a lot. You know, what was, it, of, what was interesting for me is um, coming from uh, Howard Beach, where all the young kids looked up to these organized crime figures, He's almost like, Brian was almost like, um, he, he demanded that kind of respect, like an yeah. organized crime figure in his community in Hawaii. Everybody like deferred to him. They come, we had lunch, they kissed the ring. <laughs> you, you, mm-hmm. gotta, you have to have grown up on Howard Beach to be able to say that, like, and, and actually get that that's a good thing. <laughs> they admired him as much as we admired the, cri- the criminals. But I, I know what you mean. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and it was confusing for me at first. For, yeah, he's just a surfer, but he's not, he's not mm-hmm. just a surfer. Um, he's the guy. Yeah. And and his family uh, would take anybody in. They'd bring them on the beach. They'd feed them. Um, I love I love what you pointed out. It's like the descendants. I don't know. Well, <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah, it's not exactly a Hawaiian beach here, and I'm not exactly uh, a boss. But uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you're, you're starting to say that you like. No, something. I think it's great what David hit on. I think this idea of, of the ocean becoming your church, becoming mm-hmm. your school, because and and I, I wasn't able to verbalize it uh, that way, and I didn't really understand it when he was saying it. But you're right; everything is about the ocean there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and he talked about the idea of being a waterman, and it's not just being a surfer; it's not just yeah. being a paddler. It's not just being a lifeguard. It's about being somebody who's truly of the water. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. um, and I also, uh, a couple of things that he said that I really liked, that you can put out in a general sense. He said that um, it's very important, the quality of the people that you're around. And he talked about when you're in the water, you can be the greatest lifeguard in the world. But when you're in trouble, how are the people around you? And mm-hmm. uh, you look at life, right? Um, you know, if, uh, if, if you've got it pretty dialed in, but you're hanging a bunch, around with a bunch of people who don't, when, when the wheels fall off, you need people around you who can pick you up and, and carry on too. So I thought that was, that was huge. Mm-hmm. But the other thing that he said that I thought was really, really important is when he talked about stop worrying so much about what everyone around you thinks. You know, when, when we trip, so often we're like, oh my God, do I look silly? Are people laughing at what's going on? Who cares? Get up, carry on, press on. And, um, and that just seemed really, really important. The idea about as long as you're worried about what other people think of you, you're going to be buying into their values, their mission, what's important to them because you want to impress them. Mm. And he said, once you get your own mission and your own purpose and you really know who you are, it doesn't matter one bit what other people think about you. Put your head down. Life is too short. Carry on. Get it done. Get mm-hmm. her done. Such yeah. a good point, John. Absolutely. Huge. You know, I had met him um, a year or two ago, um, and it wasn't in this interview, but it just popped into my head. They really take the water seriously. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it's almost like a CSI um, kind of seriousness. And what I mean by that is they had a shark attack. Um, somebody died. And Brian went to all kinds of lengths to figure out what happened. Why did this shark attack here? This never happens. And they found out just a quarter mile away there was somebody that they had killed a pig, yeah, had eaten the pig, it. and they take the pieces and they threw it into the water. And that caused mm-hmm. the shark attack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we probably wouldn't go to that extent here with a moose that's or right, yeah, or, sure. right, or an animal, but they, they really um, take that whole environment seriously. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and we can learn a lot from that. So uh, thanks for going down and doing that interview, Joe. I learned a lot from that. Yeah, yeah it was fun. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, okay, yeah. so speaking of interviews, SpartanUpPodcast.com, we've got a couple hundred interviews there now, um, all pretty much as good as this. I mean, you, you learn a lot of really cool things from a lot of really cool people. Can so, learn a lot from the ocean. Thank you for watching another epic story of success. If you like our message, please share Spartan Up with your friends and subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you catch our show, maybe in the woods. Spartan Up is brought to you by Spartan Race. To find a race near you, visit Spartan.com.